Hello and welcome back to CST 3130. So in this lecture, I'm going to cover uh, or introduce um, Amazon Web Services. Okay, so I'll give a little bit of an introduction, give big picture stuff. Then I'll explain how your AWS Educate account will work, which I'll provide for this course. Then I'll talk about how you can authenticate yourself, um, how local code can authenticate itself. You've got to create this kind of credentials file. Then I'll cover the two different ways you can access Amazon Web Services through the command line interface or the console. Um, and then I'll talk about S3 and how to create a static website on S3 because that's like a requirement um, for the first stage of this coursework, uh, the proposal stage, yep. Yeah? Okay, so AWS has been around for a while now, about 15 years roughly, launched in 2006 with, you know, just three, three, uh, three services. Now, I'm pretty confident it's the biggest uh, cloud provider, 45 billion revenue, you know, so it's absolutely huge. It's got loads and loads of services, some of which are pretty cool, and we're going to be using this coursework. Um, and obviously, Amazon, you know, uses its own cloud services to run its business, yeah, I think from what I vaguely remember, a lot of the Amazon web services started up because Amazon needed this massive capacity uh, to do the kind of Black Friday uh, sales. Um, and then it started selling off, you know, reselling its kind of com compute services and storage services, um, you know, that it sort of developed for its own kind of uh, Black Friday and this kind of stuff. Yeah. So this is a slightly out of date uh, picture of uh, Amazon Web Services, like it's a couple of years old, I think, but it kind of covers most of the ones and particularly the ones we're going to use in this coursework. So we've got, you know, Lambda, S3, but, you know, as you can see from this, you know, they've really expanded into a huge number of different directions, right? They've got lots of different data storage options, lots of compute options, they've got a whole ton of machine learning, some kind of natural language analysis stuff, a lot of image, smart image analysis. So quite a few students I have um, who are supervised for their final year undergraduate projects often use, you know, parts of Amazon Web Services for their projects. Like I've, I've got someone this year doing face recognition, for example, and they'll be using the Amazon Web Service for that, for face recognition to do that. Yeah. So it's really an awful lot of stuff and a lot of that stuff's really useful. So I strongly encourage you to explore other aspects of it, you know, potentially for your undergraduate projects. Yeah. So, you know, there's quite a few articles on, you know, which is the best cloud provider, but as far as I can see, you know, it's got the dominant market position, AWS, uh, and, you know, it's it, lots and lots of stuff. Uh, you know, it has some really cool events as well, which I'm going to mention as well. Uh, is it weaknesses difficult to use? Yeah, it's not that easy. Cost management, that's a bit of a tricky one with the AWS, uh, with the educate accounts. But the sort of competitions aren't very tempting either, really, which is why I've decided to go with AWS for this course. Yeah, so yes, Microsoft is your second largest provider. But a lot of it, it, a lot of the Microsoft clouds dedicated to running uh, Office kind of based stuff. So, you know, whereas AWS is very much of a developer's cloud services. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's about it, I think. Yeah, so have a look at the article if you're interested. There's a few of them out there. Um, in terms of jobs, so I certainly get the impression um, that there's a bit of a shortage of people with the skills in AWS. Yeah. I get that impression because AWS themselves, you know, quite strongly pushing their educate service and they claim, or they did a year or two ago, um, that it's, you know, one of the most requested skills on, on LinkedIn, for example. Um, and then if you just have a skim through techno jobs, which I use as my sort of barometer of kind of marketability of this stuff, then we actually turned out there's 157 pages of AWS jobs. I mean, I haven't checked every page. <coughs> there were sort of some sort of examples here. But 157 pages on techno jobs is a lot of jobs, yeah? I mean, I think JavaScript has like maybe 120 or something, you know, some of the some of the Java sort of frameworks, you know, a lot less than that, yeah? So AWS is like big and massively popular at the moment, yeah? So it's well worth spending a bit of time learning it because it, you know, definitely going to increase your employability down the line, yeah? So yeah, that's 157 pages, which I'm quite surprised by. So... This, this uh, module is really just sort of introduction to AWS, okay? I'm going to show you some of the services. We're going to put it all together into this kind of data visualization website, which I explained uh, in the last lecture. Um, but if you want to sort of take it forward and become a serious AWS developer, you know, over a longer period of time, then something you might want to consider um, is AWS certification. So there's certain exams you can take um, to get the certification. AWS also provides uh, training courses in order to, so you can actually study for these exams. And I think these training courses are free, though I wouldn't, I'd have to double check. So it's, you know, so you can, 
you know, prepare yourself for these exams and then you pay to take them. And if you pass, obviously, then you can get the certification. Yeah. So as I said, I'm, I'm going to help you get started. This is a sort of useful step on your route to certification, if that's what you want to do. Um, um, but obviously you need to spend a lot more time studying to get all the different bits um, in order to, um, you know, get those certificates. Certificates. Yeah. There's a link there giving you a bit more information about that. So these are the different kinds of certificates and they've got sort of different paths, right? So they've got, you know, the basic stuff, which is this foundational thing and then associate, that's like a step up. And then, you know, you can do sort of specialize in kind of machine learning databases and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So the two that I would, if I was sort of looking at this, you know, from a more of a developer point of view, you know, you need the cloud practitioner before you can get the more advanced certificates. So you'd have to do that. And then when you've got the cloud practitioner, you could maybe do a developer certificate, certificate um, you know, because that's, you know, most closely linked to what we're doing in this course anyway. Yeah. Now, AWS works in a number of different regions. Yeah. And a region kind of means sort of one or more of these enormous kind of server farms. Yeah. And so all of the code um, that you, and the data and all that kind of stuff that you create, there are some global things um, within AWS, but a lot of it is tied to a specific region. So if you create a DynamoDB database in US East, for example, then if you change region to US East, um, then you won't be able to see that database. Yeah, so that database is created in a specific server farm in a specific part of the world. Yeah, and it'd be kind of replicated, you know, across to another physical lo location, all that kind of stuff in case the server farm burns down. Um, but you know, it's still within that specific region and you know, it won't be, it's not globally visible and there are sort of ways of managing things in a more global way if you want to, yeah. But it's really, if it's a region is essentially, you know, a specific server farm. You can think of it like that. Yeah. So regions have like a name, like, which is kind of corresponds to the location, like US East Ohio, um, and then a formal name such as US, US dash East dash two. So in your code, um, you sometimes have to specify a specific region or a regional endpoint. In that case, you'll be using the kind of the, the formal name like US dash East dash two or lowercase. Yeah. Um, so like DynamoDB, for example, this is like the one in Ireland. So it's got DynamoDB.EU-West-1 and then dot the Amazon stuff. So that means I can access the DynamoDB within the region of, uh, of Ireland. Yeah. Regions vary a bit. Um, so a few years ago, they introduced like a London region, re London server farm. Um, that had less services supported than some of the other more, more well-established regions. So sometimes it can take time for them to roll out all of the services to a new region. Yeah. Um, for, for your purposes, you don't really have to care about regions except to avoid using them um, because the only region you can use in your educate accounts uh, is the US East one. Yeah. So this is one of the older ones and all the educate stuff runs on US East. And sometimes you'll find it will get a little bit hammered because, you know, because all the educate stuff is there. And if there are a lot of students using it and plus all the business people using it, it can get a bit busy. But in general, it's it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I've used it quite a bit, the US East one, and, it, and it's OK, despite the lag going back and forth across the Atlantic. Yeah? So something just to keep an eye on. Um, so if you start enjoying AWS, and I personally really like AWS, I think, I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, we've had, had a few differences with them recently on the AWS Educate account, but the actual fully fledged service that you pay money for um, it is really brilliant, I think. Yeah. And you'll, if you keep an eye open, and I'll tell you about these as if I come across them, you'll, there used to be, in pre-pandemic times, a lot of really cool uh, kind of AWS events in London. Yeah, so at this time, maybe three years ago, um, I went to a great event, uh, sort of just by the London Aquarium, and they had the, they always have amazing food at these things. This was like a developer day, so you know it was great food, delicious coffee, pastries, all that kind of stuff, and then some really interesting talks on different aspects of AWS technology. Yes, yeah, so I had a really good time at the developers day, and then the massive event they have in the summer, usually about May time, is uh, they have I think it's reinvent they call this thing. It's like reinvent London, and they used to have it in Excel. And then it was like 10,000 people coming to Excel. Absolutely huge event. Again, you know, great food and some really amazing tech talks, yeah? So, you know, these things are very well worth coming to talk to. to. And you can also talk to like third party providers. So a lot of third party companies, you know, work very closely with AWS, sort of, uh, you know, adding extra functionality in different ways. Like for example, some companies sell machine learning algorithms, this kind of stuff. And so they all have booths as well with a bunch of sort of swag to kind of give away. So, so it's, it's a really fun event. Um, and pff, heaven knows whether they run it live or online. Last year it was online, which is a lot, lot worse, right? <laughs> because you're just sitting at home watching Zooms as usual. But um, when it kind of, when it is live, that these things are really worth going to, you yeah? know. And there's more information there, so I'll let you know if I come across any ones that look, look worthwhile, yeah. Okay, 
<clears throat> so that's the sort of the introduction to AWS, um, and now I'm going to go into how you actually how your account will work with AWS. Yeah. So AWS is it's a company, right? They're making those forty five million dollars revenue by selling their services. Yeah. Um, and so in order to use the services, you need an AWS account. So you need access to the console, for example, the graphical console, the command line interface, and you need API keys if you want to write some local code that can authenticate itself with the, with the cloud, yeah? Now in this coursework, um, you must use the AWS Academy account that I provide, yeah? It's sort of in the coursework specification. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. So, uh, you know, because one, it means I can help you much more easily, right? Because I have direct access to all of your AWS accounts, so it's much easier for me to mark your coursework, keep an eye on your coursework, and you know, and I can actually make sure you've done your coursework, yeah. And obviously, in the online labs or whatever, I can I can just reach into your AWS account, you know, myself, and then have a little look and help you with bits of code if you need it, yeah, or configuring stuff, yeah. So that's kind of one reason. Um, in fact, the main reason really. So the other options are um, there's like the AWS uh, free tier. So you can sign up for the free tier, uh, and if, but talk to me first, because if I don't give you permission, you don't get any marks for any work you build on the free tier. But if you really want to use the free tier, for example, you can get sort of up to three months for some services, but then you need to be super careful because they'll be tied to your credit card. And if it's tied to your credit card, then you'll end up, um, you know, potentially paying for, you know, things like SageMaker can burn off quite a bit of credit. Yeah, so when, when I sort of, uh, two, three years ago, I kind of used the free tier quite a lot and end up with like a hundred dollars of you know stuff I had to pay, but luckily they reimbursed me because it was educate usage, but it was still a bit messy. So free tier is a bit risky. And also some of the some of the services on free tier, they kind of expire after three months, which probably isn't quite enough to get your project done. So in that case, you know, then you start paying for things that you weren't paying for before, like maybe DynamoDB or something like that. Yeah. <coughs> so Free tiers, if you really want to use free tier, or you've got an Amazon account with free tier, or whatever, and you know, you're rich or something, then have a conversation with me about it. But apart from that, um, you must, you know, use the AWS account that I provide you, yeah? And uh, unless I give you permission, you can't use, you know, like Google Cloud or Zero or something like that, yeah? If you've got a strong reason for doing so, have a conversation with me. I'm, I might, I'm usually willing to listen and might be give you permission, but as I've kind of argued, AWS is the largest cloud provider, so you're not going to lose any time or, you know, waste your time learning how to use AWS, and that's why I'm sort of kind of enforcing the AWS thing. And also, I don't know exactly what other services are provided, so you may not be able to fit into the coursework marking criteria if you do use Azure, for example, or Google Cloud, which might not support some of the features that are supported by AWS, yeah? Okay, so I'm going to give you a virtual... Uh, uh, like hundred dollars worth of AWS services, okay, through this kind of virtual classroom thing they've got. It's not as good. It's it's got a lot worse. Like from last year, I have to say, I've had a lot of arguments with them. But this is the best that I can do in terms of providing you with the uh, hundred dollars that you need to do your projects. Yeah. So I'll add you to the account at the beginning of next term. Then you get this invitation. Looks a bit like that. And then you kind of click on get started. I think you have to provide a few like uh, details, like a password, this kind of stuff. And then you get to then you can log into what they call the learning management system, and then that will give you access to the console and everything you need for your projects yeah so what you do is you fill in details then you log in through the learning management system there's a link to that on the course website and then when you've logged in you get this kind of dashboard view um, and you can then and then click on the course that I've invited you to which you can you can see in the email right so you can see the course number there it's like 7414 it should be in associate services because they have different levels of uh, different amounts of services and different levels shouldn't be a foundation service it should be an associate services account you can see the number there right there's a pointing can't see right there's the number there yeah um, so so click on the course I've invited you to and you click on modules and then you click on Learn a Lab Associate Services. I'm gonna give you a walkthrough anyway, so don't, don't worry if it's a bit confusing. So when you log in, you'll see this page, the dashboard, and here's this module here. This is the module that has the services that you need for your projects, yeah? And obviously if you're, uh, if, you, like, uh, if you're a third year undergraduate um, doing your project and I've given you some AWS credit, you'll see that as a separate, um, like mod, uh, whatever these things are, the course, you'll see that as a separate class. So you click on the right one for the right thing, yeah? Then you get into your learner lab, then you click on modules, it's a bit involved, and then you click on associate services. So they've got some bits and bobs which you can read if you like, but the associate services is what you want because that gives you access to the to the actual services that, so you can actually start building, you know, writing code and building stuff in the cloud, yeah? So click on associate services, and then, the, then this is the page you want, yeah? This is the page that has all the stuff you need, yeah? So it's a few clicks, but once you get the hang of it, it's really not that hard to get to there, yeah? Okay.
So I haven't played around with this console. It's probably a version of the command line interface that lets you kind of configure kind of cloud stuff using scripts and by typing, you know, command line code. But I've never played around with that, so I can't really comment on what this stuff does. Um, what you really need for these purposes is to be able to start a lab um, and to be able to access your, um, your credentials. Yeah. So to start a lab, okay, you click on start lab. And you wait for the lab to start. It can take two minutes or something. You just sort of sit there and it just grinds away and takes forever. But it does eventually get there. And then you'll be able to, uh, then the AWS icon will turn green. And then you click on that to start the actual console. Yeah. So you click on start lab and you'll see it kind of grinding away. As you see, I'll, I'll do a quick demo. I'll probably cut out a little bit in the demo because it takes can take like a minute. Um, let's click on that. And then when this turns green, so you see it's red before and then it turns green. Um, then that means that AWS is sort of up and running kind of thing. And then when you click on AWS here, um, then you'll take you through to the management console. And the management console is where you can, you know, do all the stuff that we're going to be doing for your coursework, like writing some Lambda functions, you know, setting up the database, all this kind of stuff, yeah? And I'll go through the management console later, yeah? So getting to the management console is the big step. But, you know, once you're there with your $100, you're kind of ready to start your coursework, yeah? The other thing you need for your coursework um, is your AWS credentials. So... We're going to be writing code in TypeScript, and then we're going to be transpiling that TypeScript into JavaScript. And then that JavaScript is going to pull data from web services and upload it into the cloud, into DynamoDB in this case. Yeah? So that code running on your local machine, it needs a method of logging into the cloud and, and authenticating itself with the cloud so that the, you know, the, the data gets into your particular DynamoDB and the, you know, Amazon Web Services know that this code is authenticated. Yeah. And to do that, we have this uh, kind of AWS credentials um, that we use, that local code uses to access cloud services, yeah? So to see these things, these credentials, um, we click on, you can see here, we've got show button, click on show, and then it shows you these kind of credentials here. And I'll go through what these mean in a second, yeah? So you're gonna need to copy copy them uh, you know, when you need them, and then you can paste them into a file as I explain, yeah? Okay, so let's, let's have a little demo of uh, that stuff, and then I'll come back to show you how to set up credentials in a bit. Yeah, um, it's okay. Yeah, it's a bunch of, okay, yeah, okay. So let's start. So, okay, so this is um, a learning management system. So I've given you a link to this. If you forget where it is, uh, I put a link to it in here, yeah? Okay, so obviously I've got the educator thing, which has got my own functionality I need to sort of do to add students and all that. But you should, uh, I think you accept the invitation and then you enter some stuff and then you can get to this page and then you can log in. So if we go to student login here, yeah. So this is my sort of test student account that I use for this sort of stuff. So we log in. Um, and as I said, here we are on this kind of dashboard. Um, and then we can kind of, uh, then we, then you might see several classes here. Obviously I've been playing around with this, so I've actually got a couple of classes here. But the associate service is what we want. Um, so click on associate, click on the lab we want. This is the one, this number should correspond to the number you've been invited to, yeah? Then we click on modules. It's fairly easy. And then as I said, associate services. This is the module, if you like, that has the stuff. It's pointlessly complicated, this thing. Um, and then this should take us to, uh, when it loads, uh, to the sort of the place where we can do the things we need to do to do the coursework, yeah? So then we click on Start Lab. Okay, so like I said, I'm not entirely sure what this stuff does because I haven't played around with it. So we just click on Start Lab, and then this thing, somewhat dispiritingly, uh, kind of grinds away for quite some time, um, and will eventually start. Um, I'm not even sure I'm going to sort of sit here talking through it. Okay, so started now, um, and so now we're kind of in business, so to speak. So if we click on this, uh, yeah, maybe we can just click on it directly. Uh, yeah, there we go, yep. Yeah. Click on that, that takes us into the console, and I'll talk through a few of those features in a bit. And then to get hold of the credentials, we just click on show here, and then we can kind of copy and paste that. And as it explains, we need to put this in this kind of credentials file, which I'm going to come to in a bit. Yeah. So those are the two features we need. We need the credentials from here, and we need the management console here uh, in order to do your projects. Okay. So I've done the login, console, and credentials. Yep, fantastic. Okay. All right, so this is the sort of very important thing here, yeah, is the is the budget, yeah. And unfortunately, uh, this is entirely beyond my control because I'm relying obviously on Amazon providing the credits and all this kind of stuff for the educate. But 
in a normal account, um, in a normal AWS account, you can set budgets. Yeah, you can say, well, I, I only want to spend this much per month on Lambda functions, let's say. And if I'm spending more than that, it'll generate alerts and potentially like block the service or something like that. Yeah. So it's, so it's quite straightforward once you learn how um, to manage your budget in a normal AWS account. Yeah? Because you'll find, you know, everything costs money in the cloud. Yeah. And the cloud will save you money because you don't have, as we discussed in the previous lecture, we don't have to have our pay for office space or servers or engineers to maintain the servers. It's a, it's a cheaper option, the cloud, especially if you use it in the right way. But it still costs money. Yeah? Every piece of storage costs money. Every piece of retrieval costs money. It costs money just to have things in storage. Any Lambda function execution time costs money. Yeah? You will find um, that the most expensive thing is running virtual machines. And the only time you have to do that in this project is when we're doing uh, the machine learning part, because that relies on a virtual machine that do, uh, to where you can work in with SageMaker to do the machine learning. But apart from that, this project is quite light, really, as long as you don't keep uploading data constantly to your database or something like that. You, you'll find that you won't use much credit apart from in the machine learning part. Yeah. So budgeting is something you need to learn with the cloud. Um, but unfortunately, in the educate account, you have no way of doing budget apart from the single figure that tells you how much uh, credit you have remaining. Yeah. So you only have access to the total amounts that you've spent on your account and the total amount remaining, obviously. And unfortunately, even that is possibly 10 hours out of date because there's some kind of lag in the updating of the budgets. Yeah. And just take, take this on board that when your credit runs out, you lose access to AWS and everything in that in your cloud space is deleted. Yeah. So it's a, it's a drastic thing. So you really need to take great care to back up everything from the cloud and keep an eye on your budget. Yeah. Because once that budget goes, um, you can't access it anymore and everything in there is effectively lost. Yeah. If you back up everything, you're fine, right? Because if you've got all your code and you manage to get it working once, it won't take you more than an hour or two if you do run out of credit, um, to put it together again. Uh, or if you're close to running out of your budget, then obviously uh, document what you've got in the cloud. If you, if you like at handing in time, just record your video demonstration then, yeah? But you really, really, really must keep a very close, idea, close eye on that budget as you're working in AWS. And when it starts dropping, let's say below $50, start you know becoming aware that you might be running out to the point at which you have to take some action, yeah? So if you look here in the, in the sort of screen, whatever, you can see exactly how much you've used with a 10 hour delay as I explained. Um, and then just you just got to keep an eye on it, yeah. So actually, this 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 account I think I've already done the machine learning on and some other stuff, and it hasn't taken that much actually. And when the when the, the lab will end automatically, um, you know, after three hours or something, or if you end, click on end lab. So when the lab's not running, all of the services uh, will still run. So like your static website will work, your Lambda functions will work, DynamoDB will work. I think the API gateway works as well. The only thing that doesn't work. Um, is it'll shut down all the mach all the virtual machine instances you've got running, yeah? Because they really do burn up a lot of credit. So probably if you've got a SageMaker endpoint running, it'll probably shut it down, but I wouldn't guarantee it. You know, I have to do some tests on that, yeah? So yeah, just to repeat the same point from the previous slide, you've got a hundred dollars to complete your projects. Okay, most students successfully complete their projects for this amount. Yeah, it's 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 enough, yeah. But do keep a close eye on the budget and you must back up your code regularly from the cloud. You spent like you know a day writing a lambda function. For heaven's sake, copy it into a text editor and save it locally, yeah? Because if you run out of credit because you leave something running or miss, sometimes the other thing that can burn up credit is if you've got a Lambda function um, that sort of runs but doesn't finish and, and breaks with an error, then, then the cloud may kind of keep trying to relaunch it and relaunch it and relaunch it and that can burn up a lot of credit as well, yeah? So just make sure, you know, you're kind of aware of that budget and if it suddenly starts dropping rapidly, maybe talk to me or take a look at, you know, we can figure out, you know, what, what's burning that credit. Almost certainly it'll be a misconfigured Lambda function or maybe a, maybe a virtual, maybe the machine learning component, yeah. So if your budget does get close to the limit, certainly if it's less, get, hits $20, let's say, uh, remaining, I mean, then double check your backup, okay, and contact me. And what I can do because I've got access to a couple of classrooms, yeah, I can just give you some credit in another classroom where you can finish your project off, yeah, because you'll find, as I said, once you understand how this works and you've written the bits of code, it's quite easy to paste those codes back into Lambda functions. You could reconstruct the whole thing in, you know, less than an hour probably, yeah? So just talk to me if you're running out of credit and for heaven's sake, keep a very close eye on your credit because unfortunately, um, they used to provide like a $20 sort of safety buffer, but they're not doing that anymore. And I've complained about it, but they're just not doing it and I can't do anything about it. Okay. So this is how it is. And we've just got to work within, you know, the limitations that our AWS give us. Yeah. 
So the AWS account has got better in terms of what you can do with it, yeah? Um, it's It only works in US East 1, but that's really not a big limitation. Um, you will sometimes see errors pop up to do with permissions, yeah? If you try and look at budgets, for example, you get some weird permissions errors. Sometimes when you're doing things with databases, whatever, you get some weird permissions errors. The stuff you can do is limited, but it's not so limited that you can't do your projects, yeah? It's fairly straightforward to do your projects within the limitations that they provide, yeah? I've talked about the limit, lack of a budgeting mechanism, not much you can do about it. And there is a session token for authentication which is not such a, you know, not really a problem. It just means you've got to put, refresh your, you know, copy the credentials and paste them in at the beginning of your work time. And after three hours, you've got to do the same thing again, yeah? And that's to kind of protect you, obviously, because students probably more likely to lose their secret access key and the access key. But the session token kind of protects their account because that will expire automatically after three hours, yeah? So, you know, it's limited. And as I said, if you really want to use free tier, talk to me about it. And, you know, if I give you permission, you can use free tier. Otherwise, you must use the Educate account because it's good enough for your project and you've got the credits there. And there's other reasons for thinking that it's, it's a better choice for this. Yeah. Okay. So I mentioned already the kind of AWS authentication thing, which is when you're writing local code, in this case, TypeScript converted to JavaScript, it needs to authenticate itself with Amazon Web Services. Yeah, and you'll, there'll be other kind of, in, in many other situations in which that's the case, yeah? So AWS, it's like this OAuth authentication, I think, yeah? So you have this access key and a secret access key, and also a session token as well. So, so that your local code needs to be able to, the, uh, the, AWS uh, J SDK, the JavaScript mo node module, needs to be able to access these details. So when you make a call on it, for example, to save data in DynamoDB, um, it can authenticate itself with the cloud. Yeah? I mentioned the session tokens only three hours. Yeah? So I've shown you how you can get these credentials. Yeah, you just kind of copy them there. And then what you need to do is you need to put them, well, you could put them in environment variables, you know, and that would sort of be fine, except for the session token be a real pain to put as an environment variable. variable. Or the easiest thing to do, the thing I always do, is you just create a credentials file on your on your local computer, um, and then the AWS library, the node module, knows where to look for that file. It, it'll then read the details in that file and authenticate you with the cloud. Yeah, and typically it's in C users username whatever dot AWS dot credentials. I'll show you how to do it now. Yeah. So I said, there's three components of this uh, authentication, the access key, the secret access key, and the session token. So you need to put it in, so the crucial thing, that, the thing, the mistake people often make is that they put it in a file called credentials.txt, or they put it in a file, you know, maybe capital C credentials, maybe probably wouldn't work either. So the file itself that holds these, these details must be just called credentials with no extension. Yeah, if you put an extension on it, it will not work. So it's pretty inflexible, unfortunately, but it's not so hard to do if you know what you're doing, yeah? Um, and then inside the file, uh, I'll show you the file in a sec. Yeah, it kind of looks like this. Yeah, you just got a text file like that. Credentials, no extension, and put it in a folder called .aws. Yeah. Now, if you're working on Windows, Windows will by default hide the file extensions. Yeah. So you need to click that to show the file extensions on Windows and like view, you know, in, in File Explorer. Otherwise, you might have a text extension on the file without being aware of it, yeah? So if you just look at it in text in PowerShell or if you're on like a Unix system like Mac, um, then you can just check it in the PowerShell that, you know, you can just touch a file called credentials and credit that way, yeah? But some, somewhere or other, you need to make sure it doesn't have the extension because otherwise it won't work, yeah? Okay. So just be aware of your credentials file. This doesn't matter so much for the student accounts because the, the session token will time out after three hours. Uh, but anyone who's got your credentials file can delete or change your data. So if you're working, for example, with a, you know, uh, with a real kind of real, real Amazon account um, and you've checked it into your GitHub repository, then someone could get those uh, credentials and then, you know, do crypto mining or something and cost you thousands of dollars. Yeah. So don't put the credentials file in the source folder of your code um, and just be careful with it because, and as good practice, even though in this case you're protected a bit because of the session token. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, let's have a little look at the do a little demo on the credentials side. Yeah, so I've kind of shown you where we get the credentials. We kind of copy them from there. Okay, and then I'm just going to create a new one of these. Yeah, so in Windows, so so it's in my computer, right? It's in users. Uh, that's my username, right? And then I've got created a folder called .aws. 
Now, in older versions of Windows, you couldn't create a folder called .aws. You had to create one called .aws. Dot with a trailing dot, and then Windows would kind of create a .aws folder. I tried this yesterday on Windows 10, and on Windows 10, it works fine. You can just create a folder called .aws. That's fine. And then we've got a file called credentials, and you can see here, if you do, I've got view file name extensions, so I know that this isn't credentials text or anything like that. And then if we look inside this thing, um, then here are the credentials, you know, the, the, you know, it doesn't matter if I share them because they're going to run, they're expiring anyway. Yeah? Um, so you have this kind of default stuff at the top, which you just basically copy that blob from the online thing with these three things. And then if I save that in that folder, .aws in my user space, um, then the, the node module, uh, the AWS node module will be able to find that file and authenticate itself. Okay, so yeah, I think I've covered that. Okay. Right, so I've given you a template just in case, right? So I think the template I might even have here somewhere. Uh, well, it doesn't matter actually. So I've given you a template there. So if you need to access, if you want something to get you started with the credentials, though, it's really not that complicated. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. So in order to um, do stuff in the cloud, um, we've got several options, yeah? The sort of direct ways of accessing the cloud are the command line interface and the console, or the, or the management console as it's called, actually. Um, <coughs> so I've never played around with the command line interface, but it's basically a way in which you can use code, not code, sorry, you can basically type in a console for those who like that stuff um, in order to configure and manage your cloud, yeah? Most people these days probably use uh, like a sort of framework for that, uh, it's all about this sort of buzzword is kind of infrastructure as code where we use we create a sort of yaml file or something similar and use that to kind of configure the cloud services but probably you could use the command line interface to kind of you know manage the services and you know do debug debugging and this kind of stuff yeah so it runs a command local computer possibly it also runs that looks like a command line interface um, in aws educate um, that sort of window we had um, but as i said this is something i haven't really played around with in the cloud so i can't really tell you much about it yeah so what I'm doing on this course is I'm really teaching it mainly through the AWS Management Console, yeah? So this is kind of a sort of online graphical environment where you can, config, you can set up AWS services, you can put in bits of code that will, you know, be triggered by certain kinds of events. You can create the database in there and, all the, and view things, and there's CloudWatch, it's a little bit overkill, but it kind of lets you monitor the services as they run, yeah? So this is the sort of the learner's path for getting to grips with AWS, yeah, because you've got nice graphical stuff and it's fairly straightforward to use those different graphical interfaces, yeah? So that's the sort of starting point, but once you've sort of understood how all these things work, then the, then the place to move from there is more towards kind of infrastructure as code systems, yeah? So I, I, cover, I cover this in the last lecture in this course, talking about like the serverless framework and the AWS SAM serverless application model. So these are the ways to do it properly, because obviously if you build an entire project using the management console and then you lose the project or you have to change accounts or something, then it's really fiddly to kind of reconstruct that same project in another account. Yeah, it can be done fairly quickly with, with the coursework here, but you can imagine, you know, if it was a company and we wanted it had to change accounts for some reason, because maybe we want to be hacked or something, <coughs> then it'd be a real effort, yeah? Whereas if you use the infrastructure as code frameworks, you can basically write code um, running on your local computer and use that to configure and monitor and interact with the kind of cloud services Yeah, and then if you want to change the account All you've got to do is change the credentials file deploy it and then you can just put it straight away into another account So it's like really 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 simple and then you can do versioning on your cloud infrastructure and all this kind of stuff Yeah, so the professional approach would be definitely the infrastructure as code frameworks But in order to learn what you're doing with all that It's I think it's much better to start with the management console and build a project that way And then you can migrate later to, to the more sort of serious kind of infrastructure as code frameworks yeah so on the console itself it's kind of easy right we can just sort of search for the different services we want and then we click on them and it takes us to the service um so yeah so this is kind of a sort of bit ahead of myself here but um so if you want to use like serverless or aws sam more than welcome to do that for this course i'd encourage it in fact um but it's not a requirement yeah so you might want to watch the last lecture that explains how these infrastructure as code frameworks work and then it or even you could watch it sort of part way through and then migrate to this kind of approach yeah so i have covered it in a lecture but I'm going to be mainly teaching the basic stuff to do with, you know, DynamoDB, AWS, Lambda, all this kind of stuff. We'll all be talking through the management console, yeah? Okay, so let's just quickly show you the console. Um, yeah, so this is the console, right? And then, you know, if we want different services, right? Mo uh, DB, for example. Uh, and we can, see it'll, if I press return, it picks the most popular one. And then here I can create all my tables. And then we're going to do API, gate, uh, API Gateway. 
It's uh, another service here that we use. This is the one we use to kind of configure. You can use it for REST stuff, RESTful web services, but you can also create kind of web sockets. That's what we've been doing in this module, yeah? And then in this part of the course. Um, and then we've also got, what else, you know, AWS Lambda, for example. Uh, <coughs> oh, it's taking me to some weird thing, right? I told you there's an enormous number of these things. I don't, uh, sorry, let's just let's search for Lambda. Okay, so there you go, yeah. So this is the serverless framework that AWS has. And so here we can create different functions that run in the cloud and kind of, this is covered in a later lecture, right? And then we can kind of write some code and then that code be executed in response to events that happen in the cloud. Okay, so that's the console. Oh yeah, okay, and regions. So don't mess with regions, okay? Because you're gonna be, you're gonna be using US East 1, which is North Virginia. But if you change regions, you'll get some kind of permissions error because this is like an AWS Educate account, which only works within US East 1. So don't mess with the regions, stick to US East 1, okay? And if everything disappears, it might be because you accidentally changed the region, yeah? <laughs> okay, so that's the introduction. That's how we access this stuff, how to authenticate a code, covered all that. So now in this sort of second half of this, or second last third of the lecture, I'm going to be talking about Amazon S3 and introduce that, yeah? So S3 is kind of like a file system in the cloud, right? So your file system on your local computer, right? Like on C or whatever, I can store videos, images, all this kind of stuff. <coughs> and within a folder on my local file system, um, each of the file names have to be unique. And then the folders themselves have to be, you know, unique within a, within a folder. Like on C, I can't have two folders with the same name, right? It wouldn't work, yeah? So S3 is a bit like that. And so S3 is kind of like a file system in the cloud. And then when you've got uh, things that you need to do in the cloud, like for machine learning, for example, then the, you find that uh, people often use S3 as a sort of dumping ground to put the sort of starting files and intermediate files. Anything that has to do with files and file manipulation, I think even uh, recognition, the kind of image processing, image stuff, all that, you need to get the images into S3 in order for all, any, all of that to work, yeah? So it's a sort of basic dumping ground for files, and then it can be used as an intermediate point in some of the cloud computations. You know, so the machine learning, we upload the training files into S3, and then the, the model that's created after the machine learning is stored again in S3, and then loaded back in to create the endpoint and, and so on, yeah? So, so you find it's, it's sort of used, used in many, many different ways, S3, so it's a very sort of basic sort of cloud service you need to get equipped with, yeah? And so on a, on a normal sort of local computer or whatever, we have folders and then we have files within those folders. And in S3, we have buckets. And then inside those buckets, we have objects, you know, like files or videos or images and so on and so forth, yeah? And there's a whole kind of complicated pricing, depending if you wanted, if we didn't, if we just wanted to archive stuff, we can pay less money to store in S3. Uh, and then we just have to wait longer to get the stuff out. Whereas if we had things that we needed you know, access to all the time with like millisecond latency or something like that, then we'd pay more money, yeah? As with everything in the cloud, there's a price and you can vary that price depending on how, much, how what level of service you actually want, yeah? So buckets created in regions, um, just the bucket name has to be unique. There's a little bit of a caveat there. They've got like groupings of regions, but basically treat the bucket names as something has to be unique. Yeah, you can't just use test one because probably someone's already got a bucket called test one running there somewhere. And you'll find that the buckets map onto paths <coughs> when you're doing bub public access, for example. And so obviously if the buckets aren't unique, then my path going to test one will be the same as your path going to test one and be a hopeless confusion. Yeah, so bucket names must be unique and there's certain rules about naming buckets you have to conform to. And the buckets themselves contain objects and then it's like a key value thing. So the key is the name of the file. So if I up upload an index.html, then the key is index.html and then it stores all the bytes that are the contents of the file and, uh, you know, as the value, yeah? And we can store anything we like there, really. Strings, integers, documents, Java objects, videos, so on and so forth, yeah? It's, as I said, it's just that you can treat it pretty much as a sort of cloud file system, yeah? Okay, so let's have a little look. Uh, so let's get S3. Okay. So, so, so you just search for S3 on the console. And then you can see, I'll go through, I'll do a little demo of this in a sec. And you can see all the, the buckets you've got and inside the buckets, you know, then you've got the various different kinds of objects. So that's got, you know, index HTML. This is my static website demo, yeah? And I'll go through in detail how it works in a sec, yeah? Okay, so that's S3. Um, now the first part of the coursework, um, the proposal stage has, you know, writing the proposal and all this as I explained in the talk. 
But one of the things we have, the four marks in the proposal stage, are to create a static website hosted in the cloud, yeah? So again, you must use your cloud account I give you for this. And this this sort of skill, if you like, is, is sort of just to get you started with the cloud, really. But also, when you come to your final project, you're going to put your, there's marks for hosting your website in the cloud, I think five marks, something like that. And so you can basically repeat what you've learned at this stage when it comes to your final project, so that you can then get a public URL for your website, which is, can go on your CV and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, so it's sort of a useful skill to have, yeah? So it's pretty straightforward to do this. Yeah, we create a bucket. We have to make the bucket public. So there's there's various sort of harsh warnings and stuff that you'll have to pass through because uh, obviously once you make a bucket public, anyone in the world can access it. Yeah, so you need to be pragmatic about, you need to be careful about making things public, obviously. So that's why they have all these kind of warnings. Yeah, so create a, public, create a bucket, make the bucket public. Um, we put the stuff in the bucket that we want and uh, we make that public by changing the policy. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure quite what I mean. Uh, so yeah, different approach, I guess, if you wanted to build like some kind of view or react thingy sort of in there somewhere, that's fine. Or I don't really mind. It doesn't have to be so static, but you might as well make it static because really there's no benefit to not making it static, I wouldn't say, yeah? And it has to include an image that's part of the requirements, yeah? So it's both an HTML page and an image linking to that HTML page. So this is my sort of demo. I've got another demo I'll show you now in a sec. So to create the bucket, we just click on create bucket when we're in the S3 part of the management console. Let me give it a name. As I said, this name has to be globally unique. Um, and then we uncheck uh, the block all public access. As I said, we have to sort of go through these stages to make sure that, you know, we really want to make this bucket um, public, yeah? So we uncheck it. Doesn't mean it will be public. There's another step we have to do for that. But, um, but that's certainly one of the steps we have to do, yeah? And then we have to acknowledge that, you know, we, we accept the risks of our bucket becoming public, yeah? So that's been created, yeah? So now we've got that, it's kind of sorted. Um, so then the next stage is we can upload the files to the website. Yeah, we can click on upload or actually we can just drag and drop stuff across um, once we're inside the bucket. Um, and then when we drag and drop to cost, then we see all these kind of the objects inside the bucket, yeah? Um, then the final thing is we have to, it's slightly fiddly, it used to be easy, we could just sort of click on an object and make it public. But here, but I think the only way, I've, the easy way anyway that I've found doing this is just change the policy on the bucket. Yeah, so the policy determines, you know, who can access the objects in the bucket or, you know, what people, what different people can do uh, to this bucket and stuff inside the bucket. Yeah, so we go to permissions, then we click on edit to edit the bucket policy. Um, and then I've given you a version of this and then all you have to do really is change the on. And uh, <coughs> so ARN is probably AWS resource number, some of that. So ARN, I'm not quite sure what the acronym means, um, but the ARN, each, each sort of resource in the cloud has a unique number associated with it, yeah? So this is like an ID effectively of this particular bucket. So the policy kind of references the ID and you'll find that you'll use the ARN in several other places, for example, with API gateway or Lambda functions, this kind of stuff. You sometimes have to use the resource identifier to identify another object in the cloud. And this should be like a unique uh, identifier for any, any specific resource anywhere in the cloud, yeah? So all we really have to do is change the resource. And what's it saying is that get object um, is allowed. This is just the policy name. We're saying we're allowed get um, on this particular ARN. And then the slash star at the end means that we're kind of giving permission to all the kind of all of the objects in the bucket effectively. Yeah. So we edit the policy, save the policy, um, and there's this sort of example policy which you just need to modify because my ARN is going to be different from your ARN, so you need to change that. Yeah. But apart from that, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then once we change the bucket policy, we can then click on a particular uh, thing in the that we uh, a particular file in our ob object inside our bucket. And this is, we'll have a URL, and this URL will be public um, once we've changed the policy. If, it's, if you haven't changed the policy, it won't be public, you'll get an XML error, and I'll try and show you that when I do a demo. Um, but once it's once you've changed the policy, then it'll actually give you the, the object itself, yeah? And you should see in your browser that this is, you know, you can see the URL, and here's my code or whatever, and here's my image, yeah? So when you're doing your submission for the proposal, I'd like to see a screenshot like this that shows the public URL and shows the um, the screenshot of the of the public files, yeah? Okay, so let's, let's do a demo of that, yeah? Okay, so here's my bucket. Uh, let's go back to the beginning, yeah? So let's start by creating the bucket, okay? So, uh, wait a minute. I kind of have my kind of name. I'm just going to modify the name I had before, yeah. So let's just uh, copy that. Okay, so so that's not globally unique because I've already got one. 
but this one is globally unique because I'm pretty sure there's no one to create this this mess before, yeah. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, never really figured it out. Uh, let's, so we uncheck block public access, acknowledge that we're, you know, accepting the risks and all this kind of stuff. We could, there's all these kind of sophisticated things we can do with buckets like versioning and, you know, other stuff, yeah, and encryption. But some of this won't be supported by AWS Educate anyway. So just ignore it, I think it's the best thing. And then we kind of create bucket. Okay, and then we can see here at the bottom here, we've got our test bucket here. So the next stage is, uh, somewhere or other, I've got my two files, yeah. So we just drag those uh, over to here. And then it'll, you know, blah, 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 and then it'll upload them for us. Uh, should be pretty quick. Um, okay, yeah, that succeeded. Um, okay, great. So now we've got our files, yeah. Now, just to show you that they're not public yet, yeah, if we go to index HTML, then you get, uh, then we're getting this error access denied, yeah. So if this, if I try doing this with your static website and I get this error, you're not going to get the marks because it's supposed to be a static website that's actually publicly accessible, not just, you know, to be viewed by yourself at home kind of thing, yeah. So, so we need to, need to fix the policy, okay. And to fix the policy, um, you get the policy template that I gave you, all right, this one here. So we just copy that um, and then we go back to our bucket and then we go to permissions. Uh, well, wait a minute, sorry, I'm on index HTML. We'll need to go to the bucket, not the thing itself. We go to permissions, uh, then we edit the bucket policy, uh, whack in that thing, okay, to allow it. And then we need to get the on, the uh, it's like the ID number, and then put that there, okay. So now we're saying, so now we're saying that this bucket here, anything inside it, that's the slash star here, will is is accessible when we send a get request to, to you know to get it basically, yeah. Okay, so then we're going to save those changes, which are hopefully correct. Okay, and now it's telling us that the bucket has public access, right? And then with a bit of luck, when I refresh that page, because I've made it public now, then I can access, uh, then I can see it at public, and then anywhere, anywhere in the world can see this amazing website with this picture of a cat on it, yeah? And then we're done, right? We take that screenshot and put it in our proposal. Okay, so that sort of wraps it up. Um, so here are the resources. Yeah, so you've got the link to the learning management system here. You've got the sort of credentials and the public and the policy, which you're going to need at some point. Um, and a few sort of bits and bobs about AWS. Um, I think I even put the link to the AWS events at the bottom of that. Okay, so this lecture, I've introduced Amazon Web Services, shown you how you can create a static website in S3. You're going to need that for the proposal and you're going to need that uh, for the final submission because you should have a public URL for your final website, yeah? And personally, I think it's pretty nice stuff. You know, I, I've, I enjoy this piece of coursework. It's fiddly. There'll be endless, there's a lot of JSON in this coursework, but it's sort of quite fun and satisfying, and it's nice that it all kind of runs in the cloud. So, you know, this is probably my favorite bit of coursework, I think, so I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, okay, and that's it.